<laughs> Great. Well, it's good to be with you. And also, welcome again if you're new, and especially if you're students and you're back or you're at Cape and Ray College, it's good to have you with us as well. So I um, uh, hope you uh, enjoy worshipping with us. And I uh, hope he enjoys your worship too, which I'm sure he does. Uh, we're going to read from the Bible. We're going to read from Deuteronomy. Um, one of my um, kind of favorite readings about giving. Um, it's always a bit of a surprise reading this. And I, I've looked at this passage for many, many years and many, many times. And I just wish people who preach that Christians should give 10% of their giving would read this passage and preach from it. But they never dare. Um, so anyway, that might be a bit of shock to you, but also it's harvest and we're giving God thanks. And uh, I want us to kind of focus on that this morning as part of our, our message. So Deuteronomy chapter, 20, uh, chapter 14 and verse 22, reading through to the end of that chapter. So if you read the book of Deuteronomy and, and some of these law books in the Bible, kind of uh, Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, people always kind of think, oh, I get so bogged down in them. I, I, I've got to be honest, I'm not a nerd, but I love them. And I'll tell you why in a minute. But Deuteronomy is kind of, it's the law for the land. Up till now, the people of Israel have been wandering through the wilderness and all the laws that they've been given um, are, are about being in the wilderness and what it's like to be a nomadic people. So it's everything there from potty training the people so that they build latrines in the right places uh, when they're on the move to um, how they build this uh, amazing portable tabernacle or, or worship temple. And, um, and then when they get to the edge of the promised land, Moses says, look, when you're a settled people, life's going to be different. So this is how we take the laws I've given you beforehand, and now when you're a settled people, these are how the laws are going to work when you're a settled people. And that's part of what we're reading here. So Deuteronomy 14, verse 22. Be sure to set aside a tenth of all your fields produce each year. Eat, eat the tithe of your grain. Hang on a minute. I thought you were supposed to give it. Um, eat the tithe of your grain, new wine and oil, and the firstborn of your herbs and f herds and flocks in the presence of the Lord your God at the place he will choose as a dwelling for his name. So that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. But if that place is too distant and you've been blessed by the Lord your God and you cannot carry your tithe, because the place where the Lord will choose to put his name is so far away, then exchange the tithe for silver and take the silver with you and go to the place the Lord your God will choose. Use the silver to buy whatever you like, cattle, sheep, wine or other fermented drink. They were not free Methodists. <laughs> wine or other fermented drink or anything you wish then you and your household shall eat there in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice and do not neglect the Levites living in your towns for they have no allotment or inheritance of their own at the end of every three years bring all the tithes of that year's produce and store it in your towns. So the Levites, who have no allotment or inheritance of their own, and the foreigners, the fatherless, and the widows who live in your towns may come and eat and be satisfied, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. God's word. So I... Uh, Two kind of things to begin with. I love harvest when I was a kid. I was brought, born and bred in a rural village. It, it kind of was rural in one sense, but it was also an industrial village in another sense, well, it used to be. Uh, but surrounded by fields and farms and hills. And harvest, always, always fresh stuff, not canned and dry goods like this. It was like uh, great big bunches of grapes. So as a kid, you kind of walked past and just sneaked a handful of grapes and stuck them in your pocket to eat through the boring sermon. Anybody got any grapes this morning? <laughs> and then um, 
There was always a huge sheaf or two of wheat or corn when you walked through the church doors and these, these sheaves were bound together and they stood there and there. And a great, what you went, you did, you just grabbed a whole head of wheat and you stuck that in your pocket. And then what you did is you kind of rubbed it together in your hands so all the husk would fall off the wheat. And then you'd chew the wheat again during the boring sermon. And uh, so grapes and wheat, good mix, you know. Uh, but I just loved harvest, it was great fun. I still do love harvest. But we don't harvest in the way we did, because back then, fairly agricultural, three, four thousand years ago in Israel, very agricultural, reliant on the harvest for their life, not just their livelihood, remember that. Um, we just go to Asda and Aldi or wherever and just kind of get stuck trying to choose which kind of cereal. Our grandsons come and I, I go looking for cereal. I am confused by the amount of cereal you can buy. It's just unbelievable. I just, in the end, I go, like, oh, that'll do. No, that's three quid. I'm not having that. <laughs> 90p, that'll, 90p, that'll do. <laughs> um, so I loved Harvest. But equally, I love stories of how the, the laws of God worked out in the Old Testament. Um, we all use these things nowadays. Oh, I've not switched my stopwatch on. How long have I been going already? Do you know? About five minutes. Three. Twenty-five. No, that wasn't me. It wasn't, that wasn't me. That was Steve Ellis' show at the beginning. <laughs> right, so. It's not my camera, it's my stopwatch, but we use them all the time to take photographs and then we share them and look at them and we're excited about them. I want you to think that when you come to the Old Testament part of the Bible, and particularly the laws, it's almost like every single little law is just another quick snapshot of, of who God is, how he is, and because of who he is and how he is, who and how he wants us to be. And so it's like, here's a snapshot of, of who God is, as we've read from Deuteronomy 14. Not just who God is, but, but how he is, but who and how he wants us to be. And that's what we're going to focus on for a, a little bit this morning. Um, and the first part is that, that you're coming with great thanksgiving. Another part of uh, Deuteronomy in chapter 16 when it begins the, the, the story or the, the, the commands about harvest when you've got your own fields that you can harvest wheat and corn from um, when you put the first sickle in and when you begin to cut it you had this gift offering or free will offering from the, the very first part of the harvest it was called first fruits and then um, it says you will do this as you give it you give it with rejoicing so it's not like us, you know, folk, you know, you've got a bit of Yorkshire blood in like me. So, oh, I suppose I better uh, dig, dig deep in my pockets and kind of find something. There's nothing there. It's all right. Oh, I use a payphone, don't I? That's no mind. <laughs> but it's not like that. God says, when you come and, and I've provided for you, then you come and you give with a great big smile on your heart. Come with rejoicing. And then he says... Remember, remember servants, remember priests, remember foreigners, remember fatherless, remember widows. In other words, take a snapshot of who God is, a compassionate God. That becomes a picture of how we're meant to be. We're meant to be compassionate for those who are in need. We never lose a sight of caring as God cares. So that's Deuteronomy chapter 16. And then there's a little reminder at the end of that because God says this, remember, you were slaves once. Nearly 400 years, you were slaves. Remember that and follow this carefully. Follow it carefully that you come with open hearts, hands full of gifts and giving for those who are in need, Come with a great big smile on your hearts and don't forget. Don't forget where you come from and don't forget the needs of other people. And it's that whole sense of coming with gratitude. And this passage we've read, which just blows me away because 
you've got to know, I was brought up to tithe. If you don't know what that word means, tithe is just a tenth. And it was to give 10%. And um, just a little secret, I have given more than 10% nearly all my life. Not because it's 10%. And you'll see why in a minute. He said, when you give your tithe, bring it up to the place I've chosen as a dwelling place for my name. Well, that was Jerusalem, and they built a temple in Jerusalem. So there were you, maybe in the northern kingdom, and you, you had all your harvest, and then you had to take a 10% of that, and you would take it, stick it on a car, get it pulled by the oxen or the donkey, or the kids, if no oxen or donkey, and, and, and pull it all the way to Jerusalem, and then you give it to the priest as an offering to the Lord. What does the priest do with it? He then gives it back to you. And you eat it, because what else are you going to eat in Jerusalem that week? Or if it was far too far, and you lived way up north, like nearly over the, the border into, I don't know where, Scotland, um, and, and it was too far to take the goods, because by the time you got to Jerusalem, the goods would be going a bit ripe or whatever. Um, he said, sell it at the market there and when you sold it at the market there then take the cash take the silver to Jerusalem present the tenth to the priest he'll give it you back and then it says then you can go and spend it in Aldi because you're going to need that food for the next eight days seven or eight days that you're going to be there celebrating the harvest festival and so you go to supermarket or the, the local um, bazaar or whatever and, and you buy all your goods and, and that's your food for the week. So hang on a minute, you give a tenth to the priest, he gives it back to you and you go and spend it in the supermarket, even in the off license, what was it, wine and strong drink, wine and beer, whatever, I don't know, it does anyway. So it does that and, and then it says every third year, Every third year, every third year, you either give the goods, the tenth of the goods, to the priests or the Levites, that's the priestly tribe, they didn't have their own land, they didn't have an inheritance like you might have with your land, you give it to the Levites in the town you live in, or you take it to Jerusalem and you leave it with the priests in the temple. Why? Because that's to feed them, and it's also for them to feed foreigners, widows, orphans, the poor, those who are destitute. So every third year, you didn't keep the tithe to eat yourself, you gave it and left it. Anybody doing maths? How much is that per annum? 3.3% recurring per annum. Oh, gulp, how will the church cope if we're only giving 3.3? I don't know, but I do know God's word says tithing ain't what you think it is. Anyway, what's this about? It's about coming to God with great thanksgiving for hearts and for lives where he's supplied what we need in abundance and therefore saying, God, what can I do with what you have given me? How can I respond to what you've given me? Let's take a snapshot of you, which is a good, generous, overflowing God, and let that good, generous, overflowing attitude and thanksgiving become a part of my life. How does that work out for us? Two ways. Just a question. Do you have, do we have, an attitude of gratitude. You can remember that, can't you? An attitude of gratitude. One of the things we do in our home, I don't know whether you, some of you will do it in yours, I know, because I've been, um, every single meal we stop and say thank you to God. Do you know, I just love that moment of stopping. My, my grandchildren come and I always say, right, who's, who's going to say grace? Me! Dear God, thank you for that. I said, hang on a minute. They don't get it. Grand, I'm, I'm called Grandru, by the way, not Grandad. I'm Grandru, right? They don't get that Grandru enjoys that moment where you stop. So they want to dive into grace because they want to dive into their food. They say, no, just stop and be quiet. And then, yes, you can pray. It's your turn when I say, all right, so just a moment of quiet. Dear God, thank you for this food. 
Thank you for this day. Above all, thank you for Jesus. And if, if you build that in three times a day to every meal, just that attitude of gratitude. I always say thank you when I go through the cash out and I walk away sometimes. I've got these stupid little battles in my head and my heart, do you? I think they should be thanking me. I've just given them my custom. They're just taking money out of my bank. They should be thanking me. But no, an attitude of gratitude becomes you. And it becomes a flow from a God who pours out generously into the attitude of your life that you then pour out generously onto other people. And if we just just say thank you with smiles on our faces for every single person we meet and serve or who serves us in a shop, just makes a difference. Your smile, your gratitude can make a difference. But then I also want to say that it actually will bring both worship to him and vitality into your life. Vitality in your love for God because you're constantly coming and saying thank you to him. And that will actually bring his shalom, his wholeness into your life. Listen to this report from the Mayo Clinic. Now, you, Some of you will have heard of the Mayo Clinic. It's one of the, the biggest research hospitals and clinic health institutions in America. It's it respected around the world, okay? For seven years, the Mayo Clinic was ranked number one clinic in the USA up till 90, uh, 2022. And this is what their report is. Expressing gratitude is associated with a host of mental and physical benefits. Studies have shown that being thankful and feeling thankful can improve your sleep, your mood, your immunity. Gratitude can decrease depression, anxiety, difficulties with chronic pain and the risk of disease. I'll just stop there for a moment. Two of my favourite people to visit were in my last church were two older ladies. I can't guess how old they are because I've got stopped guessing how old people are. And, um, but they were both absolutely riddled with rheumatoid arthritis. They couldn't move without feeling pain and being in pain. And yet I never remember going to visit when all they did was moan and groan. I always remember that you walk through the door and their smiles and their grace that became them even through pain made a massive difference and blessed me far more than I think my visit blessed them. Your attitude of gratitude can help you dealing through chronic pain. That wasn't to deny their pain, they never denied it. But their attitude made a difference. This is the Mayo Clinic. If a pill could do this, everybody would be taking it. Your brain is designed to problem solve rather than appreciate. You often must override this design to reap the benefits of gratitude. What's the right amount of gratitude? This is still the Mayo Clinic, okay. Simply stated, gratitude should be practiced daily. Just as you'd take that magic pill if it existed. Try starting your day by thinking of someone you're grateful for as soon as you wake up. It could be appreciating a friend who sends a funny text, a teacher who recognises your child's gifts, or a barista who uh, hands you with your coffee and shares friendly conversation. Later, thank the person with a text, a note, or a kind word when you see that person. Somebody came to me the other day about somebody else in the church. They're doing a great job. And I said, well, are you going to tell them? Uh, I'm telling you, no, what's the point of telling me? Tell them. Go and say thank you to them for the great job that they're doing. I will, but will you? And this is Mayo Clinic again. Behaviour changes biology. Remember, behaviour changes biology. Positive gestures benefit you by releasing oxytocin. Now, don't ask me what that is. I know it's a hormone, and it helps connect people. Some people call it the love hormone. Okay, just see the Barry White bit then. <laughs> it's an antidepressant and it can be released by your attitude of gratitude. You'll also benefit the person on the other end of your gesture. After all, who doesn't like to be thanked for their efforts? 
or just for being who they are. Now, attitude of gratitude to God in your heart to others becomes a snapshot of who he is, of how he is. It may not give you the opportunity to preach the gospel, but it does give you an opportunity just to be thankful and bless them with your gratitude. And then the follow-on from that is generous compassion. Note this, that, that when God says you give, you've got to remember the poor. And, um, and that's, that's amazing. I, one of my other favorite bits of Deuteronomy is what we call the gleaning laws. And some of you might remember last year I told a story from the book of Ruth about the gleaning laws. And the gleaning laws were this, that, that when you were cutting the fields, you couldn't to cut to the edge of the fields. When you went through the fig orchard and you beat the fig trees to get the figs down, you could only go beating the, fig, the, the trees once. The trees were quite glad about that as well. Um, the trees once. And then when you went through the vineyard to pick the grapes, you could only go through the vineyard to pick the grapes once. So you left wheat on the edge of the field, you left figs in the trees, and you left grapes on the vines. Why? Because then the poor, the widow, the orphan, and the foreigner... Read the book of Ruth, and a foreign widow was allowed to get corn or wheat from the edge of the field. They can be fed through the winter. They can go and get grapes and figs and corn because you have recognized their need. I love that. Another snapshot of the goodness of God. And at the end of that little passage, God says, Remember, remember you were slaves. Remember you were poor ones too. If somebody can switch my Google off my phone, I will be pleased. All right, thank you. I never even said, hey, oh, don't say. <laughs> so here in this passage we've read, we're called to give, and they're called to give and share with the poor. So giving became a consistent response to God's goodness, right? It should be a flow. God gives to us, it flows out so we give to others. It's a response to the generosity of God. A snapshot of who he is becomes a picture of how we are. I want to tell you about the beginnings of the olive branch. Okay? In the 1860s, in Chicago, as the Free Methodist Church was beginning in America, um, they had a heart to share the good news with the poor. So America, the Free Methodist Church, that, so Hope Church here is a part of the Free Methodist Church family worldwide. We're in over 100 countries worldwide. But um, it began in, in New York State, America, up near the uh, Canada border. But by this time, it got down to Chicago. And one of the first things they said is, the, the good news for everybody should be offered to all. It should be available for the poor. And one of the first statements they made is, there will be no pew rents in our churches. Because back in the day, rich people could afford the best pews. And if you were poor, you got to sit at the back. Okay. So sorry for all you at the back. You're not really poor. Okay. Right. But that's what they did. And they said, no, we're not going to live like that. We want to be a church for poor people. They can sit where they like. But then as that grew, other people began to catch the vision of what that might look like in other areas. And a lady called Rachel Bradley, who was a, a part of a free Methodist church in Chicago in 1867, began a ministry. And that ministry was called the Olive Branch Ministry. And she um, was deeply interested in the poor and needy. And she began carrying on a mission work. And I love this little bit because she was doing uh, clothing distribution. She was doing a... a, a a sewing school in church on Sundays. <laughs> and then to establish a base, they looked for a room. And I love this little bit about when they got a room. They had a room with a long table in it. It was about 15 or 16 feet long. And they were asking God if this was the right room for them to begin this ministry to the poor. And they said this, If the Spirit of God fell on us that day, it was to be decided that it was of God. 
as some in the Morgan Street Free Methodist Church tried to discourage her. That was the only Free Methodist Church in Chicago at the time, and she was a member. It was decided that Sunday afternoon that if God poured his spirit on the meeting, then it was of God. And so they began to meet and they began to pray. And as they did that, the Spirit of God fell. Listen to what they said. This was the, um, if God poured his Spirit out. And at the start of the mission, there was no money to carry out the work. It was to be a faith mission. And of a truth, the Spirit of God was poured out on us all. I thought that God was going to carry me away. My feet hardly touched the floor as I flew around the long table with my hands up, shouting and praising God. It was decided that that Sunday afternoon, it was of God. And the Morgan Street Free Methodist Church, as a whole, as a whole, promised to help her with the mission work. So instead of opposing her, they went to work with her and helped her all they could. The church was exhorted to go and help with the mission work. Sister Bradley testified many times that she was called to the work, sometimes shrank from it as there was no money. It was a faith mission, but it was the very first olive branch. Now, that's not the same olive branch as our olive branch here, but the heart is there. Now, Brother Tom Angus, who's one of our members here, he's actually been out to that olive branch ministry and worked there in the middle of Chicago, uh, working amongst um, people with drug addictions and, and alcoholism. Um, over 150 years later nearly that ministry to the poor is still going and what's really interesting this and this is just a side note okay so don't count this in the time <laughs> back in the back in the latter part of the 1800s and the beginning of the 1900s uh, a world famous evangelist called Dwight L Moody was preaching and seeing many many people come to know Jesus And when he ministered in Chicago, he was the minister of a big church in Chicago, and he met two what he called pesky ladies from the Olive Branch Mission who challenged his spirituality and told him that he needed to receive the Holy Spirit, even though he was already a successful preacher. And so finally, God began to challenge him. And one day... He powerfully, powerfully met with God and his preaching ministry took off to a whole new level and he met those two ladies again, those pesky ladies and uh, had, had fellowship with them because of the challenge they brought to him. But here at Hope Church, God wants, God longs for all he is and who he is as a loving, bountiful, generous God to be in us and flow through us for others, always. The Bulgarian mission that Gemma's highlighted this morning is part of our heart for others. Their home um, in Kustendil in Bulgaria, the, the, the safe house they developed, is for female orphans who are at high risk of human trafficking. Orphans, God calls us to care. Here, we've got the Adullam um, project, the Adullam ministry, which seeks to care for people who are battling through life-besetting problems and coming out and beginning to come out the other side, and, and we care. Bay volunteers, which seems so simple, but just to go and care for others through Bay volunteers by picking up a prescription for them, by taking them to a hospital appointment, by picking up their groceries and delivering it to their doorstep. Just to care is the flow of God's goodness through us. An olive branch where we give them just peanuts. Well, I don't know if there's any peanuts there. Not allowed anyway, it's an allergy. <laughs> no, but we've given a little bit, but our heart are to see the, the ministry of olive branch blessing Lancaster because this flow of generosity isn't just about us saying grace three times a day. It's about us giving grace. It's about us giving grace constantly. And that might mean that we give our time. So we become a Bay, bay volunteer. Or we serve in, 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 in Olive Branch or something like that. It may be that we give our time up. It may be that we give our, our treasure up, um, maybe gifts and giving. It may be that we go away and think, hang on a minute, I've never ever thought that, that financial giving 
to the church also becomes financial giving through the church for others but it does we make sure that the amount of money that we that comes in every year goes out to bless others like St. John's in in Bulgaria so there's that but then also to give what you can do your, your talent, your service, how, how God has blessed you with gifts that you can use for other people. And it may not mean that we're coming with whatever percentage God calls you to give, but we come with ourselves because we've got this open heart where God's blessing in us means that we just want to be a blessing to other people. The Apostle Paul wrote a couple of chapters on giving when he wrote to the Corinthian church I don't know if he wrote like that, but it always feels like it's better to say, well, the Apostle Paul wrote. um, We know them quite a bit at the time. He he he, he dictated it, but not into one of these things. um, But the Apostle Paul wrote, and he said these words when he was reminding the people to have a heart of generous giving. And he says this, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the grace of our Lord Jesus, God's love poured out on you, that though he was rich, for our sakes became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. And if we have an example in our Lord who poured himself out utterly, then maybe that snapshot of the cross, that snapshot of somebody giving their life up for us, becomes a picture of how we can then give ourselves up for others. Let's pray together. You're a good, good father. Thank you for these amazing pictures of your bounty that we, we've just been kind of trying to capture this morning. And we're humbled by your goodness. We're amazed by it because we know we have so much, so very, very much. And all we ask is, Lord, that, that we will never ever stop coming with, with hearts of open gratitude to you. Lord, whether it's a song or a grace, it just, just keep us thankful, Lord. Keep us thankful towards others. Always appreciating, always smiling and blessing others with our, our gratitude. And Lord, give us open hearts, open, open bank accounts, open food cupboards, so that we're constantly in a place where the flow of your goodness is coming in and then flowing out through us for others. And if I can bring a challenge to you this morning as we, we're quietly reflecting and come back in worship to the Lord, just a little bit of homework. Go away and pray. Maybe at lunchtime, don't just say thank you, God, for the food. Say, God, what do you want to say to me out of the message today from your word? What do you want to say to me about having an open life? is generous in giving to you and to others. So let God's Spirit touch your life, even this week. Maybe be prepared to make some changes. For some of us may increase our financial giving. Some of us may commit to serving, maybe Bay and Volunteers or Olive Branch. Some of us may dedicate ourselves to shop on a regular basis for Olive Branch. Just listen, just let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Let him guide you through these next few days. And when you respond, do it with a glad heart and a big smile in your heart. A stand. Let's respond in worship. Thank you.